a lot of times the hardest lesson is the thing that we need to learn the most. Hey there, thanks for dropping by. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 316. Today, I'm joined by Sensei Nathan Porter. If you're new to the show, I'm Jeremy Lesnack. I'm the host of the show. I'm the founder at Whistlekick, where we make sparring gear, apparel, and a whole bunch of other stuff that you can check out online. Whistlekick.com, Amazon, maybe at your own martial arts school. We got a lot of stuff going on. Let's talk about today. Let's talk about Sensei Nathan Porter. I had the opportunity to watch him and then train with him over a couple of years at Master Terry Dow's symposium, his weekend long training event. I saw him last year, Sensei Porter, that is, working with quite a few different people, primarily children in some of the more acrobatics that are adjacent, sometimes smack in the middle of martial arts. And I loved his energy. Well, this year I made sure that I took his class, loved it, had a great time, wonderful instructor, wonderful energy. And I just had this gut feeling, because after 300 something episodes, you can get a gut feeling that he would make a great guest. Well, guess what? He said yes when I invited him on. We scheduled, he came on, and it was great. This is a wonderful episode. I had a lot of fun. He's a really thoughtful person, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy it as well. So sit back as we welcome Sensei Nathan Porter. Hello, Sensei Porter. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for doing this. Oh, my pleasure. Before it gets... Thanks for the invitation. And... Of course. <laughs> Before it gets disgustingly hot today. Oh, it's going to be brutal. Man. Yep. Man, what are we on? Day four? Day five of this? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> just in time. <laughs> I was talking with some, some folks last night. I don't remember this many days in a row of this hot. You know, three, four days, sure. But I think we're getting up to seven in Vermont of 90 plus. Yeah. Yeah, it just keeps on climbing, you know? <laughs> and, uh, well, <laughs> what, what do you do? Just smile and nod and take what comes, right? Exactly. Exactly. There's an air conditioner about two feet from me that I've been running all morning to cool the office down so I could talk to you while turning it off because, you know, an air conditioner doesn't make for great back to background noise. <laughs> yep. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about some martial arts. Sure. I mean, that's why that's why we're here, right? You know, I mean, we, we could we could talk about weather, but I don't think anyone's tuning in to hear us discuss meteorology. Not it's not. Maybe it's a passion of yours. Maybe you're even you know, educated in it. I am not. I just, I know enough about the weather to, to complain about. Well, it impacts our training and, you know, we have to make sure that we're really, uh, adjusting for everything. So there we yeah. go. <laughs> Hydrated <laughs> mm -hmm. summer classes in the lake. I don't know if you've ever done that. That's a blast. Oh, that sounds great. Not yet, but I no. will <laughs> oh, oh, give it a whirl or, or a river training, training in a, in a river with some current. I mean, that, that will, that will help you find your balance for sure. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, this is a martial arts show. We do talk about martial arts and we're here today to talk about your journey in the martial arts. And the best place that we can really start with that is the beginning, because that's going to give us context for who you are and, and all the other stuff that we're going to talk about today. So if, if I say, hey, how did your martial arts journey start? What would you say? Well, growing up, I was always fascinated with the martial arts, always wanted to do them. But, you know, sadly, it just wasn't really available. Uh, you know, we didn't really have the time or the money to devote to classes. And it wasn't until high school that uh, I had my first martial art experience. And um, my friends dragged me into the wrestling team. And I tried out and I joined the team and I took to it. And uh, it felt like, wow, this is what I really need. And from there, I started to do kickboxing to uh, lose weight and maintain my weight for wrestling. And uh, my first night in the kickboxing class, uh, I broke the bag just with, uh, <laughs> just by, you know, I mean, it was a little overzealous then. And, um, and then, you know, the instructor said, you know what, you should, you should do the karate. And uh, from there, great. I started doing the karate as well. So I was doing the wrestling, the kickboxing, the karate. And uh, I, I just, I just took to it. Uh, you know, you just mentioned, um, jumping in a lake and a river. And I was just, I was swimming. It was beautiful. And, uh, 
from there, I started doing okay. So I had my wrestling. You know, I'm 16 now, so I've got a job, and all my money that I'm making is just going right to martial art lessons. And um, I, I said, this is this is wonderful. And down the road, there's a taekwondo school. Uh, so I would, I signed up for taekwondo lessons. And across the street from the taekwondo lesson, I saw another uh, dojo uh, that was aikido based. And uh, I signed up for aikido. And so here I am. I'm 16, 17 years old, and my day was going to wrestling, over to kickboxing, start for the karate, drive to the taekwondo, and do the aikido. You know, and that was that was my day. <laughs> uh, a lot of those martial arts fizzled out, you know, but I uh, I stayed consistent with uh, the kempo, with the the karate there, and uh, the kickboxing. I stayed a little bit longer, and so here I am, and I'm training away, and starting to compete. And then a few years go by and uh, I have an opportunity to open up my own studio. And I was really young. I opened up when I was 20 years old and I've been running martial arts studios ever since. Wow. You know, we've heard from plenty of people who fell into martial arts early or discovered their passion pretty early, pretty young. But I don't know that we've heard from anyone who built their life around martial arts that young, to be 16, to be active in, what did you say, four? I mean, if, if I, I include wrestling in there, wrestling and Kempo and Taekwondo and Aikido. Did you have time for homework? Did you sleep? <laughs> you know, my, my school grades, they did suffer a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, and then there was maintaining that job too, you know, a few days a week, but it, uh, you know, it, it felt right before doing martial arts in that capacity. I, I started to just pick up martial art books and I started reading those there too. And, um, this is right in that transition when I started wrestling, I'm like, you know what, there's gotta be some cliff notes or something. And I started reading some wrestling books and then I was like, Oh, all right, let me, let me see what else is going on. Marshally that, you know, maybe there's a strategy or some principles that I can apply. And, um, so I kept reading all these books and everything else. And yeah. And, and then sadly, you know, again, those other martial arts kind of dropped and fell to the wayside, but yeah, school definitely, uh, took a little bit of a turn there. Um, and coming up to my senior year, it really prepared me and I was planning on joining the Marines. I was going to be all military and that was going to be my next career path, you know? So it was quite a jump there. But you and, uh, didn't go into the military? No, no, I didn't. It was, uh, I was, took the test, ready to rock. I realized that, uh, no, it's still, pretty small. And I figured I'd take another year off and just train, 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 do more tournaments. And, you know, let's see, I, I ended up being the, the Massachusetts state champion at the time for, uh, sparring weapons and forms as a brown belt and, you know, trying to achieve my black belt. And, and, um, and so, yeah, I figured, you know what, another year in, and then I'll be a little bit stronger, be a little bit more disciplined, a little bit more focused. And then I'll, I'll be prepared. And uh, in that process, I got, I got recruited for uh, an athletic and talent management company. And they were looking for these athletes that they could kind of promote and, and push. And now here I am. I'm, I'm in California for a little bit. And they're, all right, they want to try to find athletic projects for me. And as I'm okay, coming over here and then I'm, I'm coming back to the East coast and, and in the process, there's the opportunity to open up my first studio. It just kind of came and, uh, thought, you know what? All right, let's give this a try. And, uh, I opened up my first studio right there. So I achieved my black belt and grew and, and that's kind of my beginning story in the martial arts. <laughs> nice. I want to go back just, just a little bit. When people are training in multiple arts, there's usually a reason, a story, something that I like to pull out of why they ended up with one over the other. So, you know, you could have gone on to college and pursued wrestling. You could have stuck with Taekwondo. You could have become an Aikidoka as your primary 
pursuit, but you didn't. You honed in on Kempo, so why? What was it about Kempo or the way it was being taught to you? The Kempo, to me, it really focuses on the adaptability of the individual. And with that, there are so many fingerprints um, in so many systems that are, they were being taught in this Kempo curriculum. And the expression that I could put forward, I could use my wrestling with my Kempo. Uh, it was encouraged. And as much as we, we have these traditional systems that are, that are locked in, and yes, we have the forms, we have the katas, we have, we have these certain techniques. Kempo allowed you to really grow and develop your mindset and, and let that come forward with your techniques. You're creating your own. You're finding your own flow. And with that comes the teaching. You know, it really forced a lot of self-development. And my Kempo time allowed me to really think about my actions, not just react and act. How much of that philosophy, which I, I can hear from you, you know, I can hear in your voice and, and the little bit that, you know, we've met and, and I had the opportunity to, to work with you a few months ago. It seems mm -hmm. like that fluidity, that dynamism in martial arts is something that's really important to you. And that would make sense because you were bouncing around, you were training in different things. So how <laughs> much of that philosophy coming through in what you were learning from Kempo do you think is inherent in the style? And how much do you think is the instruction you were receiving? Mm. Well, that's, that's the key balance, you know, I mean, especially in, in today's world, you know, it's everybody is their own individual, you know, and the instructors now really have to adapt to the student. You know, I mean, there's so much more, there's so much more knowledge readily available. Um, students are much more informed. Parents are much more informed. They expect a lot from, from their children and from their kids and their development. And I think it really forces the, the teachers to, again, really put themselves in the place of the student and, and grow their teaching methods. Um, with that said, there is definitely a place for the traditional ways of, all right, this is how it is. And, and your children do need to develop and to, def to flourish in these arts. And you want to have this, you have to have this. And yeah, that's, that's paramount. That's key. You have to be able to do self-defense if you're doing martial arts, you know, you have to, whether that self-defense is a fighting aspect and, or, um, jujitsu based or, or Aiki based, you know, there's, there's that martial art, the fighting art. But with that said, you know, now, again, it's that self-realization, that empowering the student, make them realize what they can do. And, and I think that now, even though the times are still tough and tricky in the world, we're in a pretty good place overall. And a lot of the old lessons, a lot of the hard lessons from, you know, wars gone by, they're, we're losing that time. And if we don't, if we don't recognize and remember certain points and pass that memory forward, pass those stories on, you know, students, they're not going to, they're not going to have some type of thought process on, okay, this is where it comes from. There's that tradition, how we build our thought process from there. You know, I mean, we're in a, again, a, a great time, a great place in the world. And yeah, everyone's having fun and games and training and enjoying and laughing. Um, but the seriousness uh, comes from understanding of the past and where it is. I would say that I would probably go with a good, probably a good 60 40, you know, or 70 30, as much as keeping the traditions and adapting to the individual. And then what you do is when you have those, those moments with the adult, that's when you cater it. That's when you, you fine tune the style. So to, to say it in another way, you're willing to let that ratio, that, that split between, I guess we could say tradition and individuality flow a bit depending on the student and depending on oh, of the age group. Yes. Yes, definitely. That's something that not all instructors will do. Some instructors will say, 
you know, this is what I teach, this is how I teach it, and you adapt to me or you leave. But you're on the other side of that fence. Is, have you always felt that way? Or is this something that's come from your time as an instructor? I think that as martial artists, you know, and we're always trying to, we're trying to build, we're always trying to grow. Um, a lot of times it leaves us on edge, you know, and we put up these walls, we put up these barriers. And I think that, you know, a hierarchy is important, of course, sure. Um, but there's a, there's a respect there that's, that's given. It doesn't have to be, it's, it's an earned respect without asking for it. And, you know, overseas, they're, they're really not wearing a lot of belts and systems. And I mean, styles over here, same thing. There's not really belts, but some of these oldest masters, they, they sit down, they talk to you, you know, they're, they consider you family and, and yes, different styles, they'll have the whole discipline behind it. You know, you have that warrior mindset, but it's the off hours that a lot of, you know, a lot of principles really get communicated. And I'll never forget, uh, overseas, I'm in the Philippines and you now oh, we're going to, we're going to train with this master. It's going to be incredible. And, you know, and next morning, you know, we don't know what time he's coming. Uh, we're just kind of waiting around and to do at his leisure, he starts coming in and he sits down and we're just talking and all of a sudden, all right, we're going to grab some sticks. We're going to grab some blades and we're going to train, 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 train. And but that, that essence, that relaxed point, you know, it really, it gets deeper in the heart. And they've learned all these hard lessons that we don't really have to learn. They did all the hard work for us. And as long as we respect their teaching and pass it on and, and we're listening to them, then yes, we can put it forward. We can put it forward. There does have to be a skeleton to the systems. There does have to be something holding it up. and. If you lose that, then you kind of have a hodgepodge of, of a collection of motions, but you're not really sure on the, the thoughts behind it. You know, I think that as long as that structure and the skeleton of the method is there, then, then you can fill it in. Then you have the body motion. Then you have what's going to work per individual. What did that experience in the Philippines do for you in the way that you teach? That experience... So when I was in the Philippines and I stayed there for about a month, it felt you could feel the difference between coaching and teaching and the balance between the two and when to coach and when to teach, I think is a, it's a very distinct difference. And you know, you can have these, you can have these pushes, you can have this, uh, you can have this drive. And then you have these, these educators, these instructors, these teachers, and they're really, they're really kind of getting you to learn something important. They want you to kind of learn the lesson. When I was in the Philippines, a lot of it was, was just that kind of relaxed teaching part. And they would wave in between the two and uh, and that relaxed moment really showed how how different the teaching concepts can be uh, from the Philippines to here. Uh, I was over in Indonesia for a little while and I, I'm practicing Silat and there okay it's everything is relaxed and calm and you do but then when you're on the floor or in this case it was uh, the the grass, you know, with the heat that we have here today, my goodness, same thing over there. And the ground itself is clay, you know, right under this grass. And you have to hold these positions. You have to hold these postures moving strong, strong, strong. And it's that constant correctness. And, uh, and you know, some of it is, uh, some of it is, is translational, a uh, language barrier too. You know, and that's where I think a lot of the the kind of individuality kind of dissipated over the years. When you think about your teaching now, because, you know, it's, it's clear you're continuing to train and experience, and it sounds like you're really open to adapting anything. I mean, that's kind of the, the sense that I'm getting from you. 
but you started teaching pretty young. So when people are doing something at a high level when they're young, there doesn't tend to be a lot of individualism in the way they present it. They tend to look back on how they were taught things. So you didn't have a ton of time in there to learn. I don't want to say learn well. I mean, you certainly learned well. You were an instructor. It takes a tremendous amount of skill and effort to do that. And anyone who has done it knows that. But I suspect that you've grown a lot as an instructor since then. Is that fair to say? Definitely. Yes, okay. sir. All right. Yep. <laughs> if we you, were to uh, watch you training, teaching, you know, at, at 20, early 20s versus now, what things would we see that would be noticeably different? A lot of it was just the do this because this is how I was taught kind of mindset, you know, where we're learning the how and not necessarily the why first starting out and, you know, walking in and teaching a class and teaching adults, you know, that are twice my age. You know, I have, I have youth and athleticism, you know, and, and a lot of it, yeah, that was the skill that was the first impression. And so I kind of went with it a little bit, you know, and then only when they're asking these questions that it would force me to think. And it was, it was quite a crunchy time, you know, it, ah, here I am. I have to try to, you know, keep myself above these adults that have been, you know, training when I, when they were my age and here they are again, picking it up and I have to try to show that I'm so much more knowledgeable. And yeah, I, I wasn't. I mean, to a point, I, I was sure I had a lot of training, um, but I could only teach what I knew. And that kind of grew my understanding later on. You know, it's my 17th year in the arts as far as running schools go. And with that, it really forces the it really forces a thought process behind what I'm teaching. You know? And then you can, you can sprinkle that into whatever the technique is going to be. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's always something to be said for immersion and longer term immersion. And that's really how you started. I mean, you didn't dabble, you jumped in with both feet and, and we, if you had more feet, you would have been in with those as well. And I suspect <laughs> that there's a, that's the the heart behind your teaching is that you still love martial arts. If, if not, you you do a good job of faking it. I can say that from watching you a few months ago at the event. Oh yeah, that was a lot of fun. Great event. Was it? Was a lot of fun. <laughs> We've got a good idea who you are. I think now, at least anybody listening, probably nodding their head. At, certain things, whether the folks listening are like you or not, they know someone like you, someone who once they found martial arts, like this was it, this is, this is what I will do for the rest of my life. I, I think it's pretty safe to say that's the path that you're on, but let's, let's tell some more stories. If you were up in front of a few hundred people and asked, Hey, tell everyone, entertain them with your best martial arts story? Oh, boy. What would you say? <laughs> well, you know, there's been a whole bunch over the years, and I'm sure we all have our our stories we can relate to. I mean, I remember some dojo horror stories where here I am being, being that young instructor, and I'm trying to gather my kids class together and okay, I finally have them all focused and they're finally in the right spots and they're finally ready for their lesson. And all of a sudden we're about to jump into our basics and a mouse just runs right across the dojo floor mm. and all the kids see it jump up, start screaming and running and ah, okay, here we go. You know? And, and when I, when I first started, you know, my studio was very, very small and, a little run down and yeah, that was a nice, nice little wake up into things that could happen. And, um, and of course working with kids. So 
yeah, regathering, regrouping and okay, there's that. And, and I think we all have stories of certain instructors who, all right, the, the adult students a little overzealous or uh, trying to overstep a little bit more and then, you know, boom, get hit a little too hard or thrown into a wall or. <laughs> but um, probably my favorite story actually comes from uh, the symposium. Hello, Terry Dow's event. I remember it was probably one of the first ones I attended, and and I didn't really know anyone yet. You know, I was getting to know Terry, and you know, I was invited as a guest, and, but I wasn't instructing yet there. I was just kind of to check it out and, and see how it goes. And you know, growing up, I really I didn't really grow up with a father figure, you know. And I remember going into the event thinking, well. Here I am. Everything kind of happens for a reason. I'm just going to put my uh, best foot forward and you know, get some great training, attend some events. And, and as I'm walking in and I'm and I, being respectful and bowing, of course, and, and meeting new people, and, and I'm just sitting down and watching and taking it all in. And this little old man just kind of walks up to me. And, you know, I bowed to him when I entered and I, I recognized his... Um, his mom is crest there and he sat down next to me and he starts talking and, and, uh, his name is grandmaster Robert Ho, you know, of, uh, kosher Shore review systems. And, and he's sitting down talking to me and, and we had this conversation for about three hours. You know, we separate for a little bit. I'd attend a seminar and I, but we just gravitate to each other and just start talking martially over and over again. And, I mean, he was 67 at the time. And now he's about, yeah, he's about, he's in his early 70s, mid 70s. And, you know, to hear him talk about, you know, just instruction and, and the value of martial arts now, it really left that impression on me. You know, and here I am bringing him in. He becomes my main instructor, you know, and doing seminars, teaching me privately. I'm going traveling and, and meeting with him. And, you know, that moment where you kind of put something out there and you're just unsure and kind of thinking down about certain things. But when you allow the good to come in, you know, and sure enough, I'm at this event, not expecting anything, and poof, there we go. The instructor walks right in, you know. And, you know, being an instructor, they say finding a student Finding a good student is hard, you know, but finding a good instructor is just as hard too. You know, you have to, you have to adjust the teaching style and, uh, and then you develop that synergy and then you start to think like each other. And that was a really key turning point, you know, and, uh, and it just seemed one of those days where everything clicked, everything came together. And uh, you think about as far as an instructor goes, oh, that was a, the perfect class, the perfect lesson. You know, those days that just shine and everything goes right. And that was one of those days. If you could design the perfect instructor, and I don't mean by naming specific people, though I'm, I'm sure you'll reflect on people from your past. What would the perfect instructor look like? What could we say about them? Hmm. A little bit of a curveball. This this wasn't. This certainly wasn't on the list of questions I sent you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you always think about. You always hear that saying about you know be like water. You know and that fluidity that's talked about. It's sprinkled right through from Bruce Lee all the way down. And and you know I would say for the for the instructor, you have to put yourself out there. You know people have to have an impression of you. I mean, everyone has that first impression. Everybody has that, that point of, okay, I can sum you up really quickly. But how quickly you take off those masks and how quickly you can look into somebody else, that's that growth. And that's what really comes from experience. You know, reading a room, being able to teach what needs to be taught and that's a very important part. That's the big thing. We, we're always so, we want to learn, we want to learn, we want to learn. But a lot of times, the hardest lesson is the thing that we need to learn the most. And if that teacher can find it, 
And that's the ideal one. I think anybody that's been an instructor for more than a little while has had one of those moments where you're able to, to dig through, you're able to find exactly what it is that student needs to hear in that moment. And you share it with them. You, you tell them, you show them whatever it is and their life changes. And for me, in the very limited time I had a school, I had a couple of those moments. And it was the majority of, of my motivation to continue. To yeah. know that you had an impact. Jeremy, you hit the nail on the head. That's exactly right. You know? How do you get better at that? How do you, how do you get better at reading the room or reading the individual? Well, you develop a little bit of a sensitivity, a little bit of a sensitivity to it. And um, I've been told that, yeah, oh, we, you know, I have a gift and there's this and that and we're you know, doing this thing and my school is very successful and, you know, we have 300 students and da-da-da-da-da. But, you know, it really comes down to checking the ego putting yourself in that person's shoes, you know, and having a strong memory of what you were like growing up, what this child needs in relation to you. you know? And when you can see yourself in them, as far as this one is very energized and flying around and, you know, or this one is just more reserved and calm and trying to get them to open up, what would work for you? And it, it keeps you flexible. It keeps you young. And the way you grow, hopefully, is in the years, the students are kind and come back. You know, when life gets in the way, they remember those stories. They remember those lessons. I, I can tell you most of my grade school teachers, but the ones that I'm sure I can, the ones that really stand out are the ones that I have stories with, you know, the ones that taught that lesson. Not the ones that were yelling and screaming, not the ones that were you know, making you feel really down. You kind of lock those out. It's those good memories that really shine. You have some bad sprinkled in there too, and some really negative ones, sure. But it's those good impressions, hopefully, that stick out a little bit more, float a little bit more to the surface easier. What do you do outside of martial arts? Do you have any space, any time in your life or other pursuits? <laughs> uh, you know, a few. So, I mean, martial arts, it opens up a lot of doors. And I've, you know, aside from running my, my studio, and I have 10 satellite programs that I teach martial arts in, I also, I get hired to do Comic-Cons and teach Jedi lightsaber techniques. Um, I've been getting recruited for some uh, film work. I'm actually, I'm in Equalizer 2 in one of the opening scenes there, just kind of hanging out in the scene with Denzel. Um, so there's, there's that whole thing. But as far as hobbies and pursuits go, I, I like to go hiking, uh, reading, writing, and just kind, of, uh, just kind of relaxing, you know. But a lot of it, again, is more physical. And that, that, that reading and writing is there, but a lot of it relates to martial arts, too. If we look back on the film that is your life, we're going to bump into some things that, you know, weren't going well times in your life where life wasn't all roses. Well, Tell us about one of them and how you were able to handle it better because of martial arts. Well, so when growing up, you have... And you have all these pursuits and everything. And yeah, we have relationships that go sour and, you know, all well, these different things. But when it really came down to it, you know, when I was presented with this school and I knew I wanted to do this, but again, it wasn't easy. I felt like in my, yeah, in my early mid twenties, I, here I am. I'm like, what am I doing? I'm not making any money with this, with this school. I mean, I like teaching. I can see myself getting better at it, but here I am living with my mom and 
and thinking, oh, what am I doing? I'm driving here and there. My, the own money, I mean, I'm making the bills. Uh, you know, they're getting paid. However, there is no income coming in. You know, I'm getting gas money to go back to my school. That's, that's it. And uh, it was a really hard time for, for a little while. And then, you know, you have, you have other family members and everything, and, oh, it, it looks good. But then they ask the question of, well, you know, what's going on? You know, what's the next part? What's the next point? My personal life suffered too. But it really focused and forced a reevaluation of what needs to happen. And, you know, when you, when you get hit this point and – and I remember, okay, here I am. I've I've got this this small studio, and now we're going we're going forward a little bit. I've got this this small studio, and here I am. I'm doing this again. You know, I had to close down one of my earlier studios, and and I still have no money. And you know, you're opening it on uh, just like a wing and a prayer. And here we go. I'm gonna I'm gonna just try to do what I can, and. You know, here we are. If anything goes wrong, poof, done, out of luck, shut down, you know. But you trust in yourself and you try to, again, think through the students. And uh, fortunately, it, uh, it grew, you know, in my own practice, my own teaching and, and leading through example. It was put forward and I uh, built a great name, the community. But it was, it was a very hard time for a little while. You know, success, it doesn't come overnight. <laughs> now, if you had the opportunity to go back in time, and, and let's, let's forget about the, the, the fact that learning lessons is generally better than having them handed to you, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, often if, when, I, when I ask people, if you could go back in time and talk to your, your younger self and, and share advice with them, you know, quite often people will say, well, you know, I, I wouldn't want that because I needed to learn those lessons. And, and I completely understand that and agree. But let's let's forget about that piece of it for a second. Uh, <laughs> you know, we're, we're already embracing time travel as a possibility. I think we can we can bend the rules on personal development. OK, you know, what would you tell your younger self if you went from what you know now to back then? How would you fast track yourself? We have a lot of martial arts instructors who are starting out listening to the show, we have people who are interested in becoming martial arts instructors. Mm. So your advice on this could be really impactful. I think as martial artists, we, we think that we we're the only ones who can do it. And one of the biggest things that I would love to do more of is ask for help, you know, and you think about that. And as, as a black belt is, Oh no, I got to do everything myself. And yeah, self-learning and, you know, it really, it makes life easier when you're asking for help, when you're seeking out people for advice, when you realize there are different ways to do things. And being older now and talking to my younger self, I think that just simply asking for help the right way, the right people can make me grow, uh, can make anyone grow much quicker. and stay the course a little bit longer. We, we get to kind of borrow that cliche mantra. Man falls down seven times, gets up eight. Mm-hmm. You know, that seems to come from a martial tradition and set a little more of a modern way. The best path to success is always just to try a little bit longer. To try one more time, whatever it is, just to not give up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How do you work with that with your students? Is it is it through drills? Is it through lecture? Is it both? It, you know, it's both. And the way I usually work it is you you have your your drills you develop 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 okay and. Drills are the growth of your, of your motions. Technique is what stops the drill. So without drills, technique isn't going to have a place. You want your technique to spark out. And drills are the closest thing to constant motion 
that you have to really work on. That, that, that technique has to spark out. And so drill, 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 drill. Technique stops the drill. Now the technique, that's the lesson. And how you want to approach it, how you want to relate it, uh, three-dimensionally, you know, right there, uh, single point. There's, there's a lesson right there. But depending upon the age group, that lesson can be on, you know, the drilling. You're working with somebody else. You're working with a higher belt, a lower belt, somebody, you know, different build. What do you do? You know, and you're going to encounter kids building into their coordination, growing into their bodies. They're going to hit a little harder. Um, they're going to get bumped a little bit. But it's how they adjust and react and how the instructor decides to handle it. You know, and that's, that's the difference between a kid shutting down and going, I, I don't want to do this anymore. Or that was too hard. Or having a parent coming in and saying, hey, what's going on? And, and the acknowledgement. You know, it's, you don't want a child or an adult to walk away with a problem and it happens an awful lot. So how you, how you drill the technique comes out, but how you respond to said technique, how the class responds, you know, the, the dojo, we, we bow into it. It's, it's like a living thing, you know, I mean, and with that comes a certain feel. And when you have all of these bodies in there, you know, that's the feel of the room. You have that, you have that energized feel where, oh, everything is, you know, shining and sparking. And then you have those, those days where, oh, geez, the energy gets sucked right out of the room. And you're just, you just feel like you're going to just sit down. It's just gone. But how you balance it and how you can spark it the right way, you know, putting a student on the spot so they benefit from it, you know, and they are the ones leading through example. They are the ones that are showing the technique. You're giving the correctness. You know, they feel a little bit more of that motion. They're receiving that technique. They receive how it feels. And uh, pain's a great teacher. It's just, you don't want to learn from it all the time. <laughs> Absolutely. We've heard a lot today about, you know, the different places that you're taking education, inspiration. I mean, just now, you know, we, we could almost say it another way that you're, I, I expect, hopefully I'm not putting false words in your mouth, that you're learning from your students, you know, that exchange, that energetic flow. And you've talked about some of the folks that you trained with, that you've learned from, but who's not on that list? If I gave you a, a magic ticket, you know, we're kind of playing Monopoly and it's not quite a get out of jail free, but it's a get to learn from anybody anywhere in the world, any point in time, alive or dead. Who would you cash that ticket into train with? Mm. That is a tricky one. I mean, you have, you have so many notables, you know, I... Keeping with what we've been talking about, there's a gentleman by the name of Seiken Shukamine, and he developed a style called Taido. Have you ever heard of this one? I haven't. So Seiken Shukamine was, he was a World War II pilot, and he was a kamikaze pilot, and he lived. And he <laughs> sorry, I'm and, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I, shouldn't, I shouldn't. I shouldn't laugh, but that that's either yeah. a a very good or very bad comic house. Exactly I'll, I'll right. It. Yeah, it's, it makes you think. And huh? Okay, where does that leave him? You know, is that yeah? Is that good or is that bad? Blessing or a curse? What do I do? And he comes back, and and he practiced. Uh, Practice a form of karate. He comes back and his Okinawan master is dead. And when he was spiraling and practicing these maneuvers, he thought that the karate practice was too linear. So he wanted to add more turning and more spins, different footwork. And this was, this was back in the 1960s. 
where, you know, okay, the arts are starting to flourish a little bit more. You know, there's that growth is starting to really come out. And Taido, he based these acrobatic techniques in the traditional, in the traditional system on flight maneuvers. So you'll be seeing this traditional classical kata, and then all of a sudden, a uh, level six gymnast technique, boom, right in the middle, solid stance, and then right back in. And adding that, that level of progression, uh, I thought was pretty impressive. You know, and you, you think about all of the, the do arts, you know, Aikido, Judo, and Taido was, was along those lines, but different, a little, a little extra piece in the puzzle. I would really like to know his thought process behind it, how he was coming up, how he decided to change all of these things. I think that would be a very interesting conversation, learning those techniques. I would probably, probably like to meet him and uh, try to pick his brain a little bit. They also run something called the a Tenkai, which is basically a hero is in the middle of of the dojo and they have five or sometimes 10 opponents and they have to do a sequence of techniques, uh, a choreographed movement, defending themselves for a good 30 seconds against all these different attacks and everything else. And, and you see these demonstrations and tournaments and things now, of course, sure. But back then that was part of the curriculum. You had to create these, these scenarios. And uh, I think it was, I think if we were moving back, it was pretty, uh, a pretty good point to move in time and check that out. You know, it would be a very interesting thought. Let's talk a little bit about competition. And, and before we do, there's something that I want the listeners to know. Because when, when I met you, there was something... So I, I, I never ask people their age on the show. You are welcome to share. You are near my age, as far as I can tell. I, I just turned 39. And we have something in common in that we're both kind of pushing physical capabilities. We're mm. still learning new ways to manipulate our body. Whereas, let's be honest, people that are, are knocking on 40, whether it's one side or the other, you don't generally see them flipping, literally, <laughs> and doing things of that nature, which is a bit of a hallmark for you. In fact, the instruction that you were offering at the symposium, the class I took, was all about that more advanced body movement. And I was one of, I believe, two people over 18 in your class. <laughs> it was primarily yep. mm -hmm. children. And, you know, I'll go off and I'll, I'll teach, you know, the parkour that I've learned and I'll, I'll work with people on gymnastics and things like that. And these are all skills that I learned as an adult. Most adults don't have that that openness to I, I guess i would say failure in in something like that that can have some physical consequences sure but you don't seem to have that quality and when we talk about you starting martial arts at 16 and then i know a little bit of your competitive career this is something that that's a, a um, an important piece of your personality that i just want the listeners to know before you start talking about competition so i'd love to hear and if, and if you want to respond to anything i've just said that's absolutely fine please do but i, I want to dig in i want to know what it was about competition that resonated for you well a big part as far as competition goes after wrestling you know you 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 have that all right i it's it's in there you know you have to you have that that competition um, bug and all right, I have to put myself out there. I need the adrenaline. I need to feel that push. I need to, I need to set that goal. You know, I need to train for something. And competition is a is a great thing. You know, it it helps you realize that a belt is is just a belt. You know, you get to be exposed to what else is out there, different ways of doing things. Sure. As far as movement goes, I I met a good mover named Ido Portal. Um, few years back and he's a he's a yogi he's over from israel he's he's traveling the world uh right now he's actually uh, conor mcgregor's uh trainer and uh, during all of uh the conor mcgregor 
uh, before the controversy and all the all the headaches, you know, back when he was building up a little bit more, um, he was the gentleman in the corner. He was the one showing uh, McGregor how to move, how to move, how to develop timing, how to really build that. And, you know, one of the things that he said to me, which really resonated, was your body is always trying to improve. That's it. That's the goal of your body. It's always trying to improve. And if you sit down all day long, your body is going to try to improve. Your your spine is going to tighten up. Your hips are going to tighten up. It's going to get better at sitting. You know, if you eat a lot of food, your body is going to get better at storing that food. It is always looking to get better. It has its its best mindset for you, you know. But what we need to do is improve in what we want. You know, if we're standing all day long, all right, our knees are going to tighten up. We're going to get better at standing. We want to improve the right ways. You know, as far as falling and tumbling goes, kids are fearless. Yeah, they're smaller to the ground, but they don't have those restrictions yet. All those what ifs haven't set in. You know, as adults, we we grow, we experience all these things and we limit ourselves. Uh, what if I roll my ankle and I'm a full-time martial art instructor? That's a royal pain. Uh, or, you know, I remember I was doing, I was running off the wall doing a, doing a, a back tuck off of one leg or something crazy. And I went over the mat and I, I slammed my knee down on the cement. And, uh, okay, that's not a good feeling. You know, did I just, did I crack my knee? What's going on? My uh, You know, and we all have these limitations, but what we need to do is really, we have to try to work through it, you know, and any, any advice for a martial artist kind of just starting out, you know, we have to remember that you're not the same person you were 10 years ago, 20 years ago, five years ago. You know, if you haven't trained in five years, it should take you a good five years of training to improve. You know, you have to, you have your, that counter production and you have to move through with that. You know, you can go twice as hard uh, and try to do it twice as fast, but you're going to get that burnout. You're going to get that point where, oh, all right. Yeah. This is discouraging. Or, yeah, I've been there, done that again. And the longevity in the arts is seeing how you move, how your body adjusts to certain ways. You know, the lifespan of a football player, uh, as far as game-wise, it's not a long time. Their bodies are beaten. And, and yet when you, when you freeze on that, on that pivoting motion and their knee is completely out of alignment and their hip and their – it's totally not there. You, you – uh, someone who knows the Alexander technique is going to, oh my gosh, what is going on? And yet they are the professional athletes. It's that adjustment, that adaptability that they're so good at that carries them to that pro life, um, you know, on that football game. And, and it's the constant adjustment in how our body is going to get better and improve for us that's going to carry us through. And it's worked for competitions with me. Um, as far as the traditional tournaments go, you know, now I don't do as many, you know, you have to really build a name. You have to be known by a lot of people. They have to see that consistency. Um, if anything, I'll just jump into some grappling tournaments, you know, where it's all right, I'm going to, I'm going to jump in. I'm going to swim. I'm going to see how I do win some great, lose some great, you know, nothing but learning. And, uh, and that's kind of my mindset now. I love it. Yeah. Long time listeners to the show know that, you know, that's, that's kind of my attitude, you know, this, oh. this openness, this willing to continue pushing and, and it's something I had kind of heard about you. And that was, that was a piece of why I wanted to train with you. Cause I wanted to see, you know, were you, were you like that in, in the same way that I was? And, and absolutely. And yeah, Ido Partal, um, for folks that don't know that name, we'll, we'll drop the name over in the show notes. If you're new to the show, it's whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. But he is an absolutely exceptional person. And anyone that I've met 
who has taken any training with him, they've said it was life altering. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've, I've watched people that were on a certain path with movement, with exercise, fitness, whatever you want to call it. And they just took a hard left after <laughs> a weekend with him. Yeah. Pretty incredible yep. stuff. So. Yeah. He's, yeah. He's let's, <laughs> for sure. For sure. I haven't been fortunate enough to train with him, but everything I've read, everything I've seen in video mm. has been pretty exceptional. What are your goals? You're still out there. You're still doing it. You're still training. You just talked about jumping into grappling competitions. You know, we, we haven't even talked about grappling today. So <laughs> that tells me that, you know, you are just as, as I thought, as I suggested to the audience, you're still out there trying new things, which oh, is yeah. not typical. So what is it that keeps you doing that? Are there, are there specific goals motivating you? You know, a teacher who stops learning will run out of things to teach. You know? And you have to keep re-sparking uh, that, that reason of why you're doing what you're doing. If you're, if you're not feeling good about it, you got you to gotta get up and do something about it. You have to get up and, and go. And you get a lot of connective points, martially. You know, the advanced techniques of one system are the beginner of another. And, uh, and when you are more training, you get these, oh, I understand now. I finally got another puzzle piece that I can just kind of plop right into my own mindset, you know, and, and now it makes sense. This, oh, I can relate to this now. You get that one that one sentence or that one correction where, wow, why the heck didn't I see that? And it's those points, those those little aha moments that really really make you shine. And you have to you have to apply it. If you don't test your mindset and you don't get out there and and look for a result, it's just a what if. It's just going to be something there's nothing backing it up and uh and you have to you have to back up your training you know and and when you're going out there and you're experiencing all these different things it renews life in you it renews life in your students they see the instructor getting out there and doing new things bringing something fresh back and uh and that will energize them so let's Give the audience some ways of getting a hold of you, you know, and, and why they might want to. You know, we've, we've talked a lot about you and who you are, but, you know, you're out there, you're teaching seminars, you know, whatever else. We kind of call it commercial time. So give everybody the skinny on that and we'll make sure we get it all in the show notes. Yeah, well, I run the Rising Storm Training Academy and I can be reached at, well, my, my email link is at my website, risingstormkarate.com. Uh, you can also Facebook me if you'd like. And yeah, I do seminars. I do events. Sometimes I go around the country, um, international travel. And yeah, I do seminars, uh, coaching. Sometimes I'll just hop in and, and teach everything from, yeah, soup to nuts. Or I'll just put in my two cents as far as a uh, teaching style for another instructor. And, you know, just building a good atmosphere making sure everyone is learning, working hard, and, uh, and focusing on progressive steps that kids and adults can take to con- consistently improve in their body. Right on. Nice. Yeah, and again, folks, we'll, we'll link in the show notes, so if you're driving or on a treadmill or something, no need to risk life and limb just to jot these down. <laughs> this has been a lot of fun today. I appreciate your time and your openness. And we ask all of the guests to send us out with some parting words of wisdom. So what would you suggest to all the listeners today? Well, to all the listeners today, I just say, remember where you are, remember where you're going. And as you set that goal, and you're walking that path. It's okay to look around and admire the view. And, uh, and that's the important part. That would be my, that would be my advice. You make sure that you have some goal. And if it's a little far, observe the little steps. And, uh, and if you need more, Don't be afraid to turn around and look back. You don't have to walk back. You know, I really appreciated Sensei Porter's willingness to dig, to consider. One of the things that we 
don't often talk about here on the show is how insightful people can be. Sure, we talk about that, but how insightful they can be when I kind of come out of left field. Everybody gets a set of questions. They're all the same. Most of you know that. So when I throw a curveball, when I ask a question that kind of pops out of nowhere, something that I want to know the answer to, our guests aren't necessarily prepared for that. Most of them handle it really well. Some of them will offer some kind of cursory answer. And a few of them, like Sensei Porter, stop. They consider the words. They contemplate. They go deep. And we get great stuff as a result. Thank you, Sensei Porter, for being so open and so willing to share who you are with the audience. If you want to check out the show notes with links and photos and a bunch of other stuff that we talked about today, you can find them at Whistlekick, martial arts radio. Dot com. You can find all of our products at whistlekick.com. Most of them are on Amazon. And if you want to reach out, you can find us on social media at whistlekick, or you can email me directly, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Thanks for your time today. Good luck in everything that you're doing in life. And until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.